A Good House for Children is a new gothic novel by Ireland-born, England-based author Kate Collins. On its surface, A Good House for Children is a traditional haunted house narrative, but when you dig a little deeper, at its heart, this is a novel that asks us what it takes to be a family, what it takes to have children and be parents, what it takes to raise people and love people, and what it takes to stay together and stay safe. Interestingly, A Good House for Children is a dual narrative where both narratives are set in the same house about 50 years apart. One narrative is set in the modern day, 2017 slash 2018, and we have a young family who previously lived in Bristol and are now moving to this house called The Reeve, which is in Dorset on the south coast of England, and traditionally, the house is set a little bit away from its local village, up on a cliff. The wife is Irish and a painter, and the husband has insisted that this house is the right place for them, that moving to this house is a good move specifically for their son, Sam, who has issues with mutism. And they also have a relatively newborn baby girl. Our protagonist, Orla, isn't so sure this is a good move, but goes along with it anyway, and when she's there, she starts to make friends with a few locals, she starts painting again, she finds out that even out here, people know her name as a painter, and that boosts her ego a little bit, so she's working on some new art. And she's doing her best to raise her kids. Her husband is commuting, and they're kind of trying to make it work, although, again, in traditional haunted house fashion, they start chatting with the locals and find out that there are stories about the Reeve. Stories of curses and hauntings and bad things happening, and they begin to reference something that happened in the 1970s, which is our other narrative. And so we periodically move between the modern day and 1976, and in the 1976 narrative, our protagonist is a nanny who has moved from London to Dorset to this house, which is currently being occupied by a family who've just lost their patriarch. And all we have left is the mother, Sarah, looking after four kids. An eldest boy, who's particularly sensitive, twin girls, who are suitably creepy, and a baby boy. And our nanny, Lydia, is very, very close to these kids. They love her, they trust her, especially the eldest boy. But in both narratives, the house is betraying us, betraying the people who live in it. In both stories, in both times, there is a sense of paranoia and a kind of loss of confidence. Our protagonists start to worry. They start to second guess themselves. They start seeing things. And this book is set into four parts, named after the kind of growth cycle of a plant. There's budding, ripening, blooming, and decay. And in each of these four sections, we're moving back and forth between the 70s and the modern day, and at least once or twice per section, there will be a moment of real terror, a moment where the reader will feel a chill run up and down their spine. It's not relentless horror, it is just periodic, creeping chill. And that works really well, because this is less out-and-out -out horror, and more creeping gothic, in a Shirley Jackson, Edgar Allan Poe, Daphne du Maurier kind of a way. Although those truly chilling moments are very Laura Purcell, and they really do leave you feeling a bit empty and cold when they happen. And when the protagonists learn more about the house, they start to hear stories from its past, they start to find things in the house that don't make sense, and you've got your classic horror tropes like things that go bump in the night, the sound of footsteps, thinking that someone is in a room and then that person is behind you and you go into the room and the room is empty, so whose voice did you hear? Who was knocking? Whose footsteps were those? <laughs> That's kind of a Metal Gear Solid reference. What? Whose footsteps are these? I'm sorry. But there's kind of a double creep factor. One is the chilly creepiness that I've said about already, and then the other is a vulnerability. As I said, these protagonists start to lose confidence in themselves, they start to worry, they hear stories of bad things happening to children, and in both scenarios, you've got a house full of kids. And in both scenarios, you've got kids who are kind of vulnerable. And in both scenarios, you've got a man who's either dead 
or kind of absent and careless. And so ultimately, this is about motherhood, this is about women raising kids and doing their best, figuring out what their kids need from them and how they can be there for them while the men are not there, the environment is against them, and they are losing confidence in themselves. There's a feeling that the house, the Reeve, is gaslighting them. Like all good haunted house narratives, the house feels like a character. It feels alive, it feels like it has a personality, and more importantly, it has intentions. And you wonder what it wants. Now what I really like about this is there is a mystery surrounding the house and why it's haunted, but that really isn't important. What's important is its actions, what it's doing and what happens to these women and these children as a consequence. It doesn't really matter what the house was, why it does the things it does, but rather the fact that it's doing them and dealing with those actions and the consequences of them. In that way, A Good House for Children is a very different kind of haunted house narrative. The house so often needs to have a history and a backstory. Here, it's really more important what these characters are, what they're doing, and how they handle it. And it is the characters that sell the story. Orla and Lydia are wonderfully believable, weak at times protagonists. They are struggling. And the dialogue between them and the people around them, the children, the neighbours, the people in the village, it's all wonderfully realised. It really feels tangible. I actually found the dialogue to be the most engaging aspect of the prose. Kate Collins is very, very good at writing engaging dialogue between characters. Characters whose names you might forget, but they're easy to differentiate based on their habits and the ways that they speak, and I think that that makes for fantastic dialogue and character writing. I'm really impressed by that. If you enjoy haunted house narratives, gothic stories, books that deal with motherhood and parenting, stories that feel as though they're cursed in some way, A Good House for Children is what you're looking for. This is a really cool new gothic story to check out. It's creepy in all the right ways while not being overblown, and its character writing and dialogue is absolutely top-notch. Check out A Good House for Children, and subscribe for books. And join my Patreon, please.